Welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And now to our first major conversation, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has entered its fifth day with no end in sight to a conflict that has seen a death toll of at least 198 with over 1,000 wounded. Uh, yesterday, President Vladimir Putin of Russia ordered his nuclear forces to be on high alert, even as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky uh, claimed that Russia or Ukraine and Russia would uh, conduct the first diplomatic talks since the Kremlin launched invasion, with delegations from both countries meeting at the Ukrainian border with Belarus. The Russians are, however, not um, being clear about this. Putin had earlier warned of, quote, severe consequences if foreign countries interfered in the Russia-Ukraine crisis on Thursday, Putin invaded Russia, or Ukraine rather, its neighbor to the southwest, heightening the tension between the two countries, which is said to date back to 2014. Meanwhile, Russia has been hit with several sanctions amid the invasion, including an announcement by the United States on sweeping financial sanctions and stringent export controls that will have profound impact on Russia's economy, financial system, and access to cutting-edge technology. That's what the Americans called it. Now, the United States, United Kingdom, European Union, and Canada on Saturday also agreed to remove selected Russian banks uh, from the SWIFT international payment system, which is a very important uh, payment system as far as world finance is concerned. Now, let's look at the implications of all that has happened since Thursday with our guest on The Breakfast this morning, Professor Bola Akinterua is a former director general at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. Professor, good morning to you and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, let's start off with your thoughts on this invasion um, do you agree with those who call it an invasion? And um, do you agree with those who say the West is to blame for Russia and Vladimir Putin taking this action to go into Ukraine? I believe the two schools of thought are correct. Those who blame the Westerners, the NATO countries are correct. And those who blame the Russians are not wrong for a very simple reason. First of all, uh, the entente, the agreement uh, reached with um, the Russians uh, along with um, the NATO countries is that NATO influence will not in any way, not an inch, the way to put them, of uh, NATO influence will be extended to the countries that emerged uh, following restructuring and uh, openness in Russia, that is following Perestroika and Glasnost. That was the understanding. It was so clear. They made the Americans and their allies made the Russians to understand that they would not bring NATO influence near any of um, the satellite countries of Russia. But you discover that in uh, 1996, a decision was taken, contrary to the agreement, to um, pave way for the admission of some European countries, Hungary, Czech, Poland. They did. In fact, uh, more than that, about 14 countries are under consideration okay, for NATO membership. So in this case, when you breach an agreement and you are now having an invasion of whatever kind, who is to blame? You blame the NATO countries for not faithfulness with the agreement, sanctity of agreement, principle of baptism sevanda. You have not respected that. But the same is true also for Russia. The 1994 um, Budapest uh, Memorandum provides that the territorial integrity of Ukraine will be maintained. But record has it that in 2014, Russia, for instance, uh, aided and abetted the annexation and effective anne um, annexation of uh, Crimea. That one also negates the agreement reached. Russia signed that particular uh, 1994 
would have placed a memorandum. So why wouldn't you comply with that? But when you put all this together, you will discover that it is only a living human being that can talk about security, that can engage in uh, normal activities. The Russians are more concerned that, look, Americans are not trustworthy because they have argued, and that's the summary of the whole exercise. They say that the Russians have mistakenly uh, trusted the American world too much, quote and unquote, too much. And the Americans have not taken advantage of that. So as of today, they don't trust the Americans for anything. And they are now saying that the security of uh, the Russians has become a desiderator. So in this case, who is to blame in this case? Nobody can blame Russia for seeking to ensure its own national security. And if the Americans, their allies too, they want to ensure that Russia does not take them unawares. And they now want to put their defense line to the nearest um, country to Russia. Are you going to blame them? This is international politics. And the conduct and management of international politics explains the extent to which you can survive. OK, but let's see how this pans out. So the situation where Russia and Ukraine saying they're ready to have these talks. Uh, but right now, um, Russia, Ukraine is saying they would like to meet in Poland, uh, they would like to meet in Hungary or Turkey. And these are NATO you know, countries. How do you see this playing out? Do you see Russia uh, having these talks in these places that they have mentioned? It all depends on the strategic calculations and which of them you want to take into recognition. Now, for Poland and um, all these countries to have been sending assistance to um, Ukraine, please, there is a principle in international law of mediation. According to which, when you are a mediator, you must not have partisan interest. If you have partisan interest, the likelihood of your being accepted as a mediator will no longer be there. So the mere fact that Poland is on record to have been aiding uh, Ukraine, there's no way the Russians can easily accept. It's not thinkable. True of the other countries. And uh, whether... Um, the Westerners will want to agree to a venue of meeting, say like uh, Belarus, which is um, a supporter of the Russian um, position. It is not also um, likely that the Westerners will accept. So what is most likely in this case may be to have a United Nations neutral framework, OK? And in this particular case, the same United Nations may still have the problems because both Russia and the United States are uh, better power wielding countries. So it depends on the possibility of having a mediator of international integrity regardless of where he is. The venue will not be the issue, but the critical problem to address would be the personality, the character, the integrity of the international mediator. All right, Prof, let's look at the, uh, the latest um, uh, order by Vladimir Putin, um, uh, ordering the nation's uh, strategic deterrence uh, forces or mechanism uh, to be put on alert, and we're talking about the nuclear warheads. I think um, the Americans referred to it as Satan II. Um, why is this, for those who are wondering? And um, uh, should we be afraid that Putin uh, might, might, might press th that button and release a nuclear bomb on, on the West or the entire world? 
Why should anybody be afraid? The major problem the world is presently confronted with is the fact that unlike in the past, when people were afraid, people were threatened about um, nuclear accidents. Today, nobody is afraid at all. So whether it is at the level of Russia, whether it is at the level of um, the NATO countries, any uh, strategic miscalculation can prompt anyone to use nuclear weapons. Please, it is important to draw attention to the major dynamics of the use of uh, atomic weapons um, against uh, Japan. The use of what they call little man, that is Hiroshima, the fat man, and that is uh, Nagasaki. Why did the United States use that? Japan did not know, Japan was not aware that Americans have developed atomic weapons. They decided to attack a U.S. Pearl Harbor in the belief, in the calculation, that if the maritime power, sea power of the United States is destroyed, the United States will not be in a position to enter into the Second World War on the side of the Allies, and that it will take six months at least before they can reconstitute, before they can repair, before they can refurbish the, um, the vessels. But they miscalculated. So what happened was that the United States now sat down. They had a meeting. Morgenthau, by that time, was the one who suggested to say, look, we didn't enter any war. We are not yet in war. This is an unprovoked um, aggression. So why should it be? They now said, let us use uh, what we have. Let us test this atomic weapon. They only wanted to test it, to see. Now they sent the little man, August 6, to Japan. The radioactive effects was terrible. While uh, the emperor, Hiroshito, by that particular time, was still holding meeting with his um, executive, looking, examining, investigating the implications, they, they fixed their meeting to the next day to say they will continue. But the fat man was now sent again, the fat man, in such a way now that the air was completely deoxygenated in such a way that people were dying in thousands. And then the Japanese had to withdraw unconditionally. And uh, the Japanese were brought to their knees. Please, they provoked America. So when you look at how the use of uh, atomic weapons um, came into being, it will not be far-fetched. It will not be difficult for you to know that, look, if you push Russia, for instance, to the wall, and uh, the Russians will need now to defend themselves, anything can be used. Hmm. And that is the bitter truth. So if you are now saying, why are they now talking about uh, the use of uh, nuclear weapons? It is simply because they are preparing for the worst. And the worst can always happen. So this is a time where a combination of a strategic diplomatic interventions will be required. All right, Prof. Um, let's also um, talk about some of the or the impacts of this uh, conflict. Uh, right now in Nigeria, we hear reports that due to this war that's experienced in Russia and Ukraine, uh, we may further have a prolonged scarcity of petrol, I mean fuel scarcity might just uh, you know continue because the refined products coming into the country from this region may actually face the delay. And some people are saying now ships actually avoiding the Black and the Mediterranean Sea 
and uh, that's a lot. So uh, apart from this that, that we might experience in Nigeria, are there other impacts, you know, global impacts or impacts that we can feel in Nigeria and in Africa of this conflict that's going on? The most important implication for me is the fact that the Russian-Ukraine um, imbroglio will advance, will serve as a catalytic agent for progress in Nigeria. Nigeria is on record to have always done best to make progress when Nigeria is faced with problems, when they are in difficulty. You see, the cerebrum of Nigerians work during difficult times. They become more ingenious. They come with new solutions, new approaches. But by the time, during peace time, when things are normal, nobody cares about uh, development and all those things. So when there is no uh, fuel, petroleum, or there is further scarcity, Nigerians will come certainly with new ideas of how to better secure the whole world. Not even Nigeria is the first point. In terms of uh, global implications, you know quite well that um, for Europe, they depend um, to, to the extent of about 25% of um, gas supply from Russia. The pipe passed through Ukraine. Ukraine can easily, can easily disrupt the supply of gas to Europe in order to punish Russia. But European countries too, countries that are supporting Ukraine now, if you punish Russia, and European countries will also suffer from that, that policy of disruption will amount to nothingness. In this case, what will happen is that Nigeria, being a country with a greater gas uh, deposit reserve, may compel the European countries to discuss with Nigeria how to advance, how to take advantage, how to get Nigeria to increase or to begin the export of gas to Europe. It's a matter of survival. European countries cannot survive during um, cold, war, um, cold weather. They need this thing to, to heat, to do all that. So this one can be advantageous, you know, um, to Nigeria. Another dimension is this, you see, implication, a very serious one. Of the 7,000 Nigerians uh, uh, believed to be residing, living in Ukraine legally, legally, the 7,000 estimate is based on those who are registered. Many people may be living irregularly in Ukraine. But of the 7,000, 6,000 of them are registered students in tertiary institutions, 6,000. Now, with this war, with this invasion, with this aggression, or with this uh, liberalization, give it any name you want, depending on the school of thought to which you belong, that will disrupt the education of the 6,000 Nigerians there. Because now the schools have told all students not to come to school. Many of them are in their final years. Now what will happen? We have a world, the beginning of which we do know, the outcome of which we cannot easily predict. What happens to all these students? It's not like uh, they say that uh, ASU strike in Nigeria has uh, been disrupted. But it's a more serious disruption 
the students will suffer. Okay. Uh, and most unfortunately, the Nigerian government mm. is not making uh, concrete efforts to ensure the protection of Nigerians there. Okay, so Prof, Prof, let, let, let's let's stick on that point you made now and take get your thoughts on what uh, the Nigerian uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, uh, Geoffrey Yoma, has been putting out as a statement uh, saying that he spoke on the phone with Ukrainian uh, Foreign Minister Dimitro Kuleba expressing his sympathy for what's going on in Ukraine, but also um, trying to find out um, uh, or expressing concern at the news that uh, Ukrainian border guards are hindering the exit of Nigerian citizens. But he says that Ukrainian border guards, um, that the, the Ukrainian foreign minister said, asserted rather, that the Ukrainian border guards have been instructed to allow all foreigners leave, and he promised to investigate and revert quickly. Um, uh, he says, this is Nigeria's foreign affairs minister now speaking, saying that uh, the foreign affairs minister of Ukraine reverted to say, quote, it's official. No restrictions for foreign nationals to leave the country exist. The problem is a result of chaos on the border and checkpoints leading to them, end of quote. Of course, we are, we are aware of the uh, order by the Ukrainian president, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, for males um, 18 and above not to be allowed to leave the country 18 to 60 years. So this is um, what Geoffrey Eber, Nigeria's foreign minister, continued to say by saying, I'm personally coordinating with our missions in Ukraine, Poland, Russia, Romania, and Hungary to ensure we get our citizens out of Ukraine and bring back to Nigeria those ready to return while supporting those who are remaining in Ukraine. So uh, um, it, what, what's your own view of this, this latest move by the Nigerian government? <laughs> well, the fundamental difference between a passport and a visa is not far-fetched. Passport is a recommendation, is a, an appeal, is a permission given to the holder to travel out. So why, for instance, um, the Ukrainian government says all the Ukrainian borders are widely open. Whoever wants to go out can go out. That's the level of passport. The passport to travel out. But having a passport to travel out cannot be synonymous or be equivalent to visa entry. Even when you have visa well stamped on your passport, you still have the mercy of the immigration, the security officers at the border post to allow you in. Yeah, yeah, That's the level of visa. Yes. Now, the, the, yeah, Prof, the sorry to interrupt you, sir, but the, the uh, Nigerian minister, uh, embassy in Ukraine, and I uh, think, if not the embassy in Ukraine, the foreign affairs ministry had already said that um, uh, uh, the, the authorities in, in Hungary uh, are willing to allow foreign nationals with uh, a Ukrainian visa, three months visa in, in Ukraine, in, in Hungary. So if you can cross the border into either Hungary or Poland, as long as you have uh, a Ukrainian visa and you but have your, your, your nation's passport, it's valid for three months. And he also says that, um, just, to, just to chip this in, that um, our missions, that's Nigerian missions, have been directed to send staff buses uh, or staff and buses to the border points in their respective countries. Um, these are uh, quickly, Ukraine, Poland, Russia, Romania, and Hungary, um, to, to transport Nigerian citizens, basically. I am very much aware of the facts that you are giving me. I monitor, and uh, I do analysis chronologically as it is. When I'm talking about visa, please, initially, many Nigerians were at the border of uh, Poland. It got to a point that Poland now and uh, now decided that, look, we cannot allow foreigners, Nigerians, to come under these circumstances. That was initially. That was why Nigerians complained bitterly to say that they are having challenges at the border, even with Poland. They are, it's well reported. So I am only trying to say that you can have passport to travel out. But we need to have a visa-free, you know, uh, entry. You must have an entry that does not go along with challenges. That's the point I'm trying to make there. The mere fact that um, we, we have um, our embassies that uh, posted letters 
now saying they have uh, designated uh, different officers uh, for them to come, get to some countries through different um, ports of entry. I am aware, we read all this, but I am only trying to draw your attention to the fact that, look, please, we are told that you make haste, not slowly. You, you don't make haste slowly, the way the foreign minister of Nigeria is trying to do. Not when people have been uh, embarrassed and are being challenged here and there. Many Nigerians are hiding in the metros, underground trains, you see. So what the issue is, uh, my own um, evaluation of what the government of Nigeria is now trying to do is that it is unnecessarily too late. We need to have preventive strategic measures to protect Nigerians during crises, during emergencies, and so on and so forth. It's not uh, what is foreign policy that is always reactive. What is it? What are they doing? And you can now see, for instance, National Assembly said um, they will be going to um, Ukraine to evacuate when the government had already banned commercial air flights. The airspace already had been made uh, inaccessible. That is how we behave in Nigeria. It's always fire brigade. So please, if they are now saying people can travel, can go by road, etc., many people have been injured, Nigerians. They will never tell you, they will never report. I wouldn't be surprised in the next uh, mail press statement that the minister will be making. They will say, no Nigerian has been affected. That's our style. So please, um, if Nigerians are able to quickly escape, we should thank um, some countries that have voluntarily accepted to facilitate those countries that have said, well, if you are able to identify yourself with your national passport, they will give you um, a refuge, a place. That one is good enough. But let me tell you, but this is just the beginning of the problem. All right, uh, Professor Akin Terewa, let's also look at this issue, which you have also attested to the fact that some Nigerians, uh, Nigerians and others, uh, they're probably a black skin color issue, uh, have been discriminated, like you have mentioned. They have been discriminated and have not been allowed. We saw a video of uh, Nigerians not being allowed to that train. Now, what is the essence of globalization then? Where is the argument for globalization that talks about peace and you know, global prosperity at this point in time? It is a conflict situation. Should nations like this be reacting this way at this point in time? Should skin you know, be um, a determining factor? Or should we be talking about global peace and prosperity? You see, the problem with your question is that you are reasoning very logically. You have a humanitarian plot in your vessels. That's the problem with it. International relations, international politics does not follow that type of logic. He does not. The truth is simply that, look, they preach the sermon, the epistle of sovereign equality. They preach the sermon of globalization. They preach the sermon of international peace and security. But please, von Clausewitz once told us, if you want peace, prepare for war. Secondly, the manufacturers of war weapons Manufacturers of nuclear weapons, is Nigeria part of them? Is Congo part of them? Is Ethiopia part of them? They are the major nuclear wielding powers. They call them the P5, UN Security Council. So when you talk about globalization, what is globalization? Globalization is a new instrument for decolonization. It emphasizes technology 
ICT, etc. So now, if you are refusing the old style of colonization, now, internet, what is it about? It's good for everybody, but it is a major instrument of international control, whether you like it or not. Why is China against uh, the location, the initiative of the U.S.? Internet headquarters is in California, in America. If you travel to China today with your telephone and the uh, internet, uh, this Western world, automatically they will be erased at the point of entry, at the airport channel. It will be replaced with Chinese uh, 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 model. Why? So please, uh, to answer directly the, the, the question, it is not good enough. It is not uh, fair. In fact, it is unjust for somebody to be in a dangerous situation, to be threatened, and then you discriminate against them. And you would now be saying, we are in the same world. Please, we are not in the same world. Discrimination is still a major pillar of international politics. You take about the uh, COVID-19 vaccines. They now say, look, it's um, nationalism. They want to give you what they do not need anymore. It is on record that, for instance, at a point in time, when they were developing the vaccine in the U.S., is it not on record that the American government said, look, um, they, should, they should not give the type of vaccines meant for the American citizens. They will say they should prepare special vaccines <laughs> for all other countries for Africa. So what, what are you now telling me? So it's survival of the fittest. You are to determine to play your politics in such a way that your own self-interest is giving, you know, uh, particular attention. And that is what is happening. Okay. Don't blame people who refuse to, uh, who discriminate against us. All right. You too should, you should learn to discriminate against them. I, I see. Interesting. Very interesting analysis from you and very uh, uh, much appreciated. Um, uh, only time will tell, uh, Prof, if the sanctions... Uh, uh, against uh, Russia by the United States, uh, the EU as well as other countries like Japan uh, will work. Um, but it's been a pleasure having you, sir, on the program this morning. Professor Bola Akinte Rinwa is a former Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you for giving me the means to learn. Oh, we hope to have you, have you soon again. Uh, we, we're, we're learning from you and uh, we appreciate that, sir. Thank you Thank for you coming. Well, mercy, time to move on. Yeah, definitely time to move on. And when we return, we'll be looking at the second conversation. The fact that finally the Electoral Act Amendment Bill has been signed into law by President Mohamed Buhari. What does this hold for us as our democracy uh, continues to evolve? And what is the hope for the 2023 elections? Please stay with us.